Hello, I'm Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I'm talking about the Pad Island Rare Machine that has just gone live in North America. So, Pad Island is a summery beach-themed event with numerous water cards that should, in theory, be able to help populate your monster box. Sadly, this event as a whole is one of the worst ones possible because there is basically atrocious value in the bottom rarities. 75% of the rolls, so basically six, five, and four star cards have almost no value and duplicates are seldom going to be required. As such, you're going to be like slogging through numerous sad rolls and even then at the top, only some of them are truly magical and those have terrible rolling rates. So with that in mind, if you are truly gung-ho about any of the top rarity cards in this event, you will be better served by utilizing the monster exchange system in order to acquire them without wasting your magic stones because basically any event is going to have more overall average value per roll than the beach event. So in terms of the pros and cons, it's a five magic stone event, which does make it cheaper to roll, but at the same time, it's the cheapest not to roll whatsoever. You can easily skip this event and you won't be missing that much overall because on the drawback side, there is little value in dupes for the four to eight star cards. Basically every card has very little value as a dupe unless it's the top rarity, which is a 2% chance total of being rolled because these at least have weapon assists. And in all in honesty, you could basically stop right here and take, have the takeaway message of don't roll, you're going to be sad in the vast majority of cases because all these cards here represent the vast majority of the bottom rarity here. So without further ado, let's take a look at each individual card. So the first card feature is the new Beach Planner, which comes at the nine star rarity, which of course means it's going to be very powerful. And you got to obviously like rein in your expectations for the rest of this event because they're gonna put the most exciting card at the top, make it super hard to acquire, that sort of idea. And she is definitely a jam packed card because she has four skill boosts. She has significant personal damage of double seven combo VDP. She has an L to unlock your board and her super awakenings are quite powerful. And depending on whether you take super blind, machine killer or VDP will depend on your team composition and what you actually need to bring to a given dungeon. If you're lacking blind resist, that's naturally a solution. If you're playing Shura Realm, the Machine Killer will have more value. In addition to wonderful awakenings and hefty weighted stats, Beach Planner also has an amazingly strong active skill. For one turn it gives plus three combos, which is technically a damage boost. It's not a huge damage boost, but it's a subtle damage boost and obviously it helps you overcome combo shields. It fully reduces all unable to match orb effects as well as all bind and awoken binds. So it's quite a jam packed active skill on a 13 turn cooldown and at least one component should be useful at any given time because plus three combos is reasonably significant enough. It should be able to add a little bit of damage even if you can't take advantage of the other metrics, it's still gonna have some value. And the fun of her doesn't stop there. As a leader, she's actually able to have quite a large amount of durability due to her two times health for fire attribute cards large attack multiplier and damage reduction to matching fire and water. But in addition to matching fire and water for damage, you also get a damage reduction component. So it makes me almost think, well, maybe I could pair of Beach Barber and Julie. I've seen some people float around saying maybe pair of Dante. I'm not quite sure what is the best pairing for her at this point in time. It's highly, it's a 1% chance I'm going to roll her on my free roll. So it's probably not going to happen. So it's hard for me to necessarily experiment and tinker around. But if you are fortunate enough to acquire her, let me know what team compositions you've found value in. But for myself, if I were to roll her, I feel like I would find significant value from her as a sub because she brings so much to the table and basically will help me address unable to match orb effect clearing because that's actually a mechanic my monster box is relatively weak at countering but may not necessarily be the same for yours. For her weapon assist, she retains that same powerful active skill and she has a full bind immunity and an enhanced heal orb and it makes me think of the umbrella weapon assist, but instead of a fujin or damage absorption style active skill, you get that same powerful one that her base form has. But the biggest drawback of this weapon assist is the opportunity cost. If you pursue this weapon assist with only one beach planner, you're not going to be utilizing her as a sub or a leader, which in my opinion is much more valuable at this point in time. And the nice thing about these high top rarity cards is that you can utilize them now for their base and sub forms and then once that gets power crypt or becomes irrelevant convert to a weapon assist and then you might have value once again that's a nice aspect of weapon assist if the card is strong to begin with you can hold off on making the weapon assist leech as much value as possible from their base form and then convert when they're no longer useful and now, relatively speaking, everything is going to go downhill from Beach Planner overall, but there are still quite a few strong cards, obviously, at the 9 and 8 star rarity. And the first one is the 
last of the nine star cards, which is Beach Varroa. So Beach Varroa's main claim to fame is her unique active skill, no, unique leader skill, in which it adds, well, two times health for it, water, but it has a large attack multiplier component when you match nine or more connected water orbs. So that means a VDP proxit as well as a full swipe of water orbs, like a full board swipe. But in addition to that, you also gain plus three combos with this. So dual leaders, you have plus six combos. That's kind of absurd when you truly think about it because you can have a full mono board of water orbs, swipe it, one combo becomes six. Like math is hard, but like this is taking it to a new level. And it's this ability to add so many combos into her that makes her able to overcome quite a large amount of content and the high durability with her flat health multipliers ensures that she can actually tackle challenging endgame content as well as farming content. And the biggest crutch with her is going to be the orb hungriness of her leader skill. She needs nine water orbs to truly shine and function. And if you don't have nine water orbs, you're not dealing much damage. And that is going to be the most problematic aspect of her because you basically have to find a way to stall and juggle your health, which can be done, of course, with uh, healing solutions such as Mel, or Lakshmi, or Mutt. But the point of the matter is you are an orb hungry leader. It's going to be slower, but at the same time, she is still powerful and can clear plenty of content. Along with her active skill able being able to generate numerous water orbs on a short five turn cooldown. Yes, you do kind of dunk your own RCV, but you're getting so many water orbs that you can at least activate and probably kill a spawn. Just be mindful that she does not have auto follow up attack. So if you are using dual beach Varroas, you make sure you actually have a column of hard orbs as well as your VDP to overcome resolve spawns. In terms of her weapon assist, I'm not truly aroused by it in any way because it gives you, I guess, a dungeon boost. There's only four weapon assists that give dungeon boost, but it's not worth the opportunity cost of losing Beach Varroa. She's doing so much more for you at this point in time, and I feel like she's still going to be relevant for quite some period of time. And choosing this weapon assist is truly just really luxurious. You're going for that one dungeon boost awakening, which can help if you're able to stack many and many of them up, but at the same time, it's probably not going to be applicable for the vast majority of players. So just keep in the back of your mind that this weapon assist does exist. If you get multiple Beach Varroas, at least there is possibly some value out of it. Either way, let's take a look at Beach Yogg. So Beach Yogg comes in a bikini, which is truly weird because he's supposed to be like an outer god, a cosmic entity. So of course we got to put him in a bikini because, you know, pad. But either way, his base form here is not the form we want to look at. His brand new form is much spicier by comparison because it improves basically every aspect of his kit because his awakenings and weighted stats are significantly improved. For this new hot summer Yogg, they have strong personal damage, triple seven combo with a VDP, relatively high base attack, huge, like a healthy amount of HP, along with that desirable active skill that creates a full board of water and hard orbs, along with 40% health heal and reducing all bind and awoken binds by four turns. <clears throat> so I like multi-component active skills because not only can they counter one mechanic, but they might also overlap and counter other things. But it also helps ensure that at least one aspect is going to have value and if it comes with an orb changer it's almost always going to have value no one's going to be upset by using an orb changer later in the dungeon it's going to at least help out any given team and that's one nice aspect about yogg here but another helpful thing is with that high personal damage and the ability to take god or machine killer latents he can function well in cont like alterina 4 <clears throat> where there are at least a modest number of gods towards the end there are are countless machines in Shura Realm, so he does have value in that place there. And these big weighted stats do get heavily bolstered if he is able to use the co-op boost awakening, but that does mean you are basically forcing yourself to use him in co-op because otherwise one of these awakenings go to waste. And amusingly, his biggest drawback is I feel also two skill boost and that co-op boost awakening, which doesn't bring much in solo mode. It might be hard to transform and co-op boost obviously doesn't take effect. But if you play in co-op, your two skill boosts are manageable because you have additional four more cards to acquire skill boost from from your partner. So that is definitely covered. And then you get the big stat boost from co-op boost awakening. So I feel like he does definitely have more value if you play in co-op, but in solo mode, it is a little less powerful. Next is Beach Barbara and Julie. And Barbara and Julie come with comes with seven unique killer awakenings and each killer provides three times personal damage against the opposing spawn and 
The key with utilizing her effectively is trying to line up spawns with multiple typings because then her personal damage just jumps more and more exponentially. If they have three of the same typings that she has killers of, that's 27 times personal damage. That's significant and it doesn't require any combos. So just keep in the back of your mind that she is a reasonably strong offensive solution against basically any double typing spawn. It's nine times damage at that point in time. Pretty solid overall. And they can use the god machine or balance type killers, which have proven quite helpful as of late. Her active skill is able to create a full board of fire and water orbs along with 100% defense break. So if you are facing something with stupendously high defense, it does help. But the board unlock with the two colors is quite powerful on a 13 turn cooldown already. And her active, or sorry, her leader skill has been also improved. She does give flat health multipliers for fire or water cards, as well as four times RCV of dual leaders if you match water and fire orbs, which will give you that RCV bonus. It'll give you plus one combo, so plus two with dual leaders, and your 256 times attack multiplier, as well as having plus four seconds of orb movement time. And as a whole, this is one of the easiest leaders to use in my opinion. All you have to do is match water and fire, no combo count requirement, and bam, your full attack multiplier, Barbara and Julia for killers can do meaningful damage. You get plus two combos, you have four additional seconds to move orbs, you can tank lots of hits, you can heal back up from those attacks. She's quite well-rounded, but of course she does still have limitations. Her active skill doesn't produce hard orbs, she doesn't have auto follow-up attack, which means she will have to be mindful of her active skill usage when facing resolve spawns, and she has no innate damage reduction. You have to be aware that 100% gravities will kill and execute you, but as I mentioned beforehand, Beach Planner wants to utilize water and fire matches, so I feel like it is possible to pair Barbara and Julie with Beach Planner. You get that auto fall up attack, you have the same matching requirements, but you just need to be aware that Beach Planner only gives you health multiplier bonus if the card is fire attribute, which could be the main or sub attribute. So Barbara and Julie obviously fit that bill. But at the same time, this is an easy leader to use. I wouldn't monster exchange for it at this point in time because I feel like her peak has definitely passed, but she still can clear a large amount of content. And amusingly enough, this is actually my mom's favorite leader to use. She's been using it for years and she just defaults to it when she doesn't know what to do because it's just so simple and easy for like easy mid-range and some hard content. Next is Beach Fujin, and she has become significantly upgraded because she now has a VDP awakening alongside of her triple seven combo. So now she is a wonderfully offensive card who can deal damage against any spawn, as well as piercing through voids. So she will be meaningfully contributing to your team in that regards. Furthermore, she has one of the most important slash mandatory active skills you need to bring into any dungeon at this point in time, which is damage absorption counter. And as a whole, I think the whole notion of damage absorption and being forced to bring a direct active skill counter is absurd. It's one of the worst design mechanics in the game because there is no way for you to overcome a damage absorption spawn at this point in time in current endgame content without an active skill to counter it. You're either stalling for 999 turns or you bring this active skill. So basically you either bring this active skill or you quit the dungeon. It's a stupid design, which means we have to bring it. And that also means Beach Fujin becomes much more valuable because it's coming with the active skill we need to have. And it gives you two turns of damage absorption void. And those two turns definitely pay dividends in Alt Arena 3 or Arena 5, where there is a 25% chance for back-to-back -back damage absorption spawns. It makes your life much easier. Yes, the second spawn only has a 10 turn of absorption, so you could stall it out. But if you're going for clean efficiency, you want to be able to have two turns to cover both of them in that 25% chance that does occur. And in addition to that, it gives you one turn of haste, which I guess is cool. But the main drawback of Beach Fujin is this 19 turn cooldown and Gung Ho's new strategy of placing numerous damage absorption spawns within a single dungeon, but spaced a few floors apart, which prevents this two turns from carrying over and actually being useful. I think it's a bit of a shame in those regards, but that is going to be one of the bigger issues that holds Beach Fujin back, this longer cooldown, which means it might be harder to have it ready in time for back relatively closely spaced spawns. But another big issue is let's say the dungeon has damage absorption spawns maybe two times throughout the dungeon, but the final absorption spawn is maybe like midway, maybe like 60, 65% of the way through the dungeon. And then after that, no more damage absorption spawn. Beach Fujin would have an inherit of some kind, but that inherit will probably never charge up because you need these 19 turns to charge up for your base active, plus the inherit, 
probably not going to happen. So now you have a card carrying kind of like a dead active for the rest of the dungeon. It doesn't apply in all regards, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind, along with the fact that transforming cards can have this damage absorption counter on a much more fast and frequent basis. For instance, Pollone, who is a bottom rarity card, wants to transform, and then once she transforms, she has an eight turn damage absorption counter for one turn. So that means those closely spaced, but still multiple floors in between absorption encounters can now be countered much more easily because that's eight turns compared to 19. That's 11 turns of stalling difference. It can make a big and noticeable change in your team's performance. Lastly, for the eight-star cards, we have Beach Eshamali, who is a lopsided card in the sense that she just has seven of her nine, or well, ten if you count Super Awakenings, taken up by water enhanced water orbs. Now, these will add significant amounts of passive damage to your team, but at the same time, it's going to be difficult to truly incorporate her onto any given team because she's providing passive damage. It's not personal damage, so she's not a true damage solution. She can't deal meaningful amounts of damage on her own. She makes everyone else perform better. But at the same time, she doesn't provide any resists or any true utility. It's just a powerful orb changer that creates water skyfalls. Useful active overall, but not really utility oriented as well. So when you build a team, you tend to have dedicated cards who can deal meaningful personal damage, and then utility supportive cards that counter the mechanics in the dungeon. Eshamali doesn't do either, so she's kind of almost like a win more sort of card. If you're already able to counter everything, you can make everyone else do more damage, but that might be kind of excessive at this point in time because generally speaking, overwhelming damage is not necessarily something that's needed. Surviving mechanics is much more important. And for myself, when I build teams, I prioritize counter having all the right resists and countering every mechanic possible. Because if I can counter every mechanic possible, I'm probably going to succeed and clear the dungeon. Damage is rarely an issue. You have other ways to layer in damage or just in general, multipliers are so much higher. Personal damage is much higher compared to before. Most things can die outside of like sure realm style content with relative ease. So I feel like it's just difficult to find a truly great home to utilize her on because she's not necessarily enabling anything else aside from just passive damage, which as mentioned before, can be somewhat redundant. Now we come to the seven star cards and none of these cards can be monster exchanged for. And of course, at the same time, a lot of their value can be questionable. And the first is the new Beach DQXQ, who has, I guess, modest amounts of utility, but at the same time, not really providing enough overall. You can provide a significant and noticeable amount of bonus health for your team due to three to four team health awakenings, as well as having two bonus seconds to move orbs. You could take a tape resist with your super awakening instead of the fourth team HP. So like, it's an interesting set of awakenings, but at the same time, I don't feel like it's really solving that many problems. Most of the time, excessively large preemptives are not going to kill you anymore because we tend to have enough effective health to survive these things. So the team health may not be needed. Two bonus seconds of orb movement time is nice, but again, most teams have enough orb movement time. And tape resist is one of the lower priority resists in my opinion. So as a whole, DQXQ is not providing much in the way of resists, not that much in the way of true utility and countering mechanics, and she has no personal damage. So she's kind of like that Beach Eshmali, not really being able to fulfill many roles that well, and it's just a weaker card overall. Her active skill does produce a four elemental board with one turn of haste, but four elemental board is kind of a weird number. It's not enough for rainbow teams because you need to have four colors, not necessarily, usually four colors, not necessarily three colors plus hearts. So that can be an issue there. Mono water teams won't necessarily get enough water orbs from a four elemental board changer. It's just a weird place. She's kind of floating in this middle ground of like, I'm trying to do a bit of everything, but not really truly succeeding. So as a whole, I feel like she's just an underwhelming card. And as a leader, the effective health is not high enough to truly tackle much more challenging content, but I guess the orb skin is kind of pretty. Next is Beach Tardis. And Beach Tardis has significant personal damage when you match a TPA and hit those seven combos, as well as a two turn base cooldown active skill. And this active skill will provide you with one second of bonus orb movement time, so overwrite time debuffs, as well as clearing all unable to match orb effects by two turns. Now, unable to match orb effects are not the most outrageously common mechanic, but being able to counter them at least a little bit can make a difference because it might just be enough to allow you to survive before the monster's next move set takes hold and does horrible things to you. And with a two turn cooldown, it means you can inherit something over top of each TARDIS, use that active skill in a meaningful way, and then have that little two turn active charge up to overwrite the debuff. Small things overall, but it can add up. 
But I feel like TARDIS's main appeal will be utilized as a farming leader because they have, well, bigger health, so it makes it able to tank just bigger preemptives, but they have meaningful amounts of attack multiplier when matching four or more connected water orbs, so that TPA or a full board swipe, as well as 18 times attack for dragon type cards. So relatively easy to activate leader skill. You need to pop an active, you need to match four or more water orbs and be a dragon type. It's not the hardest thing to overcome, especially if you're playing through a shorter dungeon where you can plan out and manage your active skills accordingly. And you can deal quite easy damage as well as having auto follow attack as well afterwards, which overcomes resolve. So technically, if you have a way to have like a way to generate multiple water orbs, you can like swipe or pseudo swipe your way through a dungeon, auto follow attack through resolve, and possibly farm some stuff interestingly. Of course, the value of TARDIS, I feel, will hinge on what other farming style teams you have available in your given monster box. Next is Beach Metatron or Wetatron. Some people have called her that. It's stuck in my head for some strange reason, but she has fantastically wonderful artwork in my opinion, but her base form is not the form we want to look at because we want to really look at this newer form. And this newer form provides you with a healing solution. It She does have significant amounts of RCB. She does have enhanced hard orbs to take advantage of it. So she can be able to provide large amounts of healing. She can take eight latent slots for even more healing output. It's kind of like a Lakshmi or a Mutt or a Mel. She can provide large amounts of healing output for a given team. And her active skill is at least a four turn cooldown, which is easier to inherit over top of. But at the same time, at least it clears three turns of binds or awoken binds, as well as a small amount of healing. So pretty useful utility card in that sense there. The main drawback is she doesn't really provide resist, but that L Awakening does help. The double skill bind resist does help transforming cards when they don't have skill bind resist in their pre-transformed state. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. But the, her main drawbacks are, well, no personal damage, no resist, and the active skill, while helpful, is not that high impact. You can inherit something else over top of it, but the base active skill is not going to be necessarily putting out the types of output you want to have, perhaps. Next is Beach Sonia, or Beach Grania. That's another weird name that's come out of her because it's just the way it is. And in her base form, it's not the form we want to look at because both forms share the same active skill. And in this form here, she has triple Dragon Killer, double TPA, and the ability to take a VDP Super Awakening. So she's basically a wonderful solution for smashing through dragons. If you don't have many other dragon killing options in your monster box, Beach Sonia is going to be even more helpful. But even if you do have solutions to dragon killing, Beach Sonia may be a little bit spicier overall because she does provide you with a bicolor board of two elements with two turns haste. And in the past, that has been used to cheese out ranking dungeons with multiple two turn haste with bicolors, but it might still be helpful because you can utilize it to hasten up other active skills. And even though we may not necessarily get ranking dungeons with that same template where we can overcome it with ease, which is bicolor haste spam, it's still potentially a valuable ranking dungeon solution because let's say you get to the end, it's a dragon spawn of a void. Well, we pop Beach Sonia and bam, we got a bicolor board that we can solve, proc that VDP, smash through the dragon killer, or just yeah, basically the idea is I feel like she's going to be a nice damage solution against dragons, but of course, that's her main true value. If you're not facing dragon spawns, she's not going to have as much value overall. Beach Pandora, kind of like the other 7-star cards that have multiple forms, her base form is not the stronger one. Like, there's no real reason to keep her in the base form because her pixel form is much stronger. And her pixel form has triple healer killer, double VDP. So kind of like Beach Sonia in the sense that she is able to smash through a specific type of monster while having the ability to pierce through voids. So again, it can be a definitely a strong farming or ranking dungeon solution if the spawns in question are healer and tanky. But in addition to that, Pixel Pandora has the ability to provide two turns of damage absorption void, which is more meaningful in newer content because damage absorption becomes much more lethal in higher current content compared to the older, earlier dungeons. But at the same time, it means you have to bring Beach Pandora as a sub, which may or may not necessarily be what you want to do. Like, yes, she does have leader skill with strong multipliers, but it forces you to use all pixel evolution cards, which tend to not be the greatest cards overall, especially if it's a whole team comprised of pixels and the multipliers are not high enough to truly justify it, I feel, overall. But again, Beach Pandora, wonderful healing killing solution with a color absorb void, which can be helpful in the right situations. Beach Artemis has a super blind resist, but her biggest issue is she mixes rows and TPAs, which in turn makes 
one of them useless. You're not going to match a row in a TP on a given board. That requires 10 orbs. That's just not efficient overall and unlikely. She only has one skill boost, which is, of course, a little bit of a drawback. But at least on the bright side, she does have that two turns of damage absorption counter. And you can still slot her into a team. You got that super resist. It's like a super resist is worth five awakening. So even though she has kind of wasted rows and TPA, you just kind of overcame that slightly with that super blind resist. It does provide a little bit easier time team building. And again, even if you cannot use the damage absorption effect, it's still a double orb changer of fire and heal orbs to water. So you are still at least producing water orbs for your mono water teams to push through. Just be mindful that the one skill boost will hinder transformation. But again, depending on the types of teams you play, it may or may not be relevant. Next is Beach Tachibana, and Beach Tachibana has a cloud resist. She has triple seven combo and a little bit of 20% resist to blind and jammers. But even though these awakenings are reasonable overall, I feel like she's just kind of become relatively a generic card. Like she has poor weighted stats with basically no recovery. And Cloud Resist tends to be relatively easy to acquire, especially through weapon assists. So I find like Cloud Resist naturally on the cards a little less appealing. Again, that may not necessarily be the case for you, but with Fagin Rise weapon assists being one of the most commonly seen ones, it's not too hard to find it on your friend's leader. But either way, a triple seven combo card is still nice, but it's not special in this day and age. And these two 20% resists, unless you are actually using things like Samurai 3 weapons or building the 20% resist to fully populate it, they go to waste otherwise if you use a super resist. If you have Beach Tachibana and Artemis on the same team, Beach Artemis provides it super blind, which then immediately invalidates this awakening. So Beach Tachibana just lost another awakening. And that's a little problematic. She has two skill boosts, which again can hinder transformation. And I just feel like she's a relatively generic card. You can use her, but she's not that magical. And the active skill again provides you with a five elemental board of hearts. So I guess rainbow teams can at least take advantage of that. You get plus two combos, but it's still a relatively generic active skill. It's not countering mechanics, so to speak. If it had, like, say, unable to match orb effect clearing, bind or awoken bind clearing, tag on, attack buff, RC, anything else that counters mechanics, she would become a little bit more helpful. But at this point in time, I feel like she's just kind of generic. Next is Beach I and I. And these two girls have the ability to provide meaningful personal damage with a VDP and seven combos. They also provide 20% resist to blind, jammer, and poison orbs. And as mentioned already, if you're comboing with things like Samurai 3s, you're, you're efficiently taking advantage of those awakenings. But if you start using super resist, it's gonna be less helpful because those awakenings quote unquote become wasted. And wasted awakenings is not something we want to have a card like we don't want that on your cards nowadays because it's so competitive to be utilized in, on a team and pad. Like if you have two out of your nine awakenings being not helpful, it's much less likely you're gonna be chosen for a given team. But with that being said, she's still a reasonably strong card. Like she, her active skill provides you a bicolor board with water and light orbs that provides an unable to match orb effect clear by five turns. So at least that provides a nice extra layer of utility there. And as a leader, she's still a reasonable option like she has modest amounts of health she has some damage reduction reasonable attack multiplier not the best in the game but still respectable enough that you can get by quite a bit of content and it's reasonably easy to use all you need to do is match six or more water orbs like it is going to be a bit orb hungry but hey it's you can still tank through stuff with that little bit of health multiplier and depending on who you pair with it can make it so your effective health jumps up higher just be aware that like she is not as top tier anymore and directly buying her for the orb skin like I don't think it's necessarily worth it at this point in time. And now we come to the six star cards, which are just gonna be sadder and sadder the further we go down for the most part. And Beach Erd gives you modest amounts of passive damage. She does have a cloud resist, but again, it's kind of like a weaker Beach Eshimali. Like she provides a tiny bit of other things, but these tiny bit of other things are not necessarily gonna make her that magical. The active skill is okay, fire, water, and hard orbs. I just feel like Beach Erd is gonna be really just a transitional sub. You will use her, for a period of time and then you will just move on when you start acquiring better cards. I acquired a beach yard a long time ago. I used her for a little bit. I've kind of forgotten I had her. I haven't used her in so long just because there are just stronger options available, unfortunately. Beach Chester has four skill binders, this which is unique. But at the same time, do we need 80% skill bind resist protection? Like it's completely unnecessary. Like it's so rare you're gonna build a team of not enough skill bind resist because if you think about it, a team has six cards and each card on average has one. If one of those cards is missing it, you still have 100%. So why would we need Beach Chester? 
no real reason. And abysmal weighted stats, like an active skill that's not going to really do much. Like, yes, you remove unable to match orb effects, but that's a mechanic you see in late, like newer content. You're not going to bring Chester into newer content. So there's no real applications for Chester at this point in time. And seriously, 780 weighted stats at level 110. Like, what is that? That is absurdly low. That's just sad. Again, that's going to be the theme for most of the cards here. Beach Meimei, kind of like Eshimali in the sense with lots of enhanced orbs, but she has two in different colors, so like less overall damage, less strong of an active skill, less weighted stats. It's just a card I don't really foresee being utilized anywhere. Like the active skill doesn't make hearts, you can't, can't heal it. Like it's just low impact card overall, and it's just sad because all these beach cards are the same idea. Beach Lakshmi, when Gung Ho was designing her awakenings maybe you could say well we have four skill boosts but everything else is kind of like what awakening should we give her the answer was yes let's give her a bit of everything she has no focus no concentration she does a little bit of everything but we want cards that are concentrated we don't want like someone to be a jack of all trades master of none she's definitely a master of none but the point of the matter is like she doesn't achieve much you could say well four skill boosts is cool but I could farm a Tengu, and that's four skill boosts as well, with a shorter base cooldown, and possibly, maybe, well, Tengu probably has worse weighted stats, but like, a thousand weighted stats is not something we want. This is an active skill we don't really want to have necessarily. Yes, it makes some harders, but this is not a card we want to use. Use Rare Machine Lakshmi if you really wanted to have a Lakshmi on your team. Jeez, next are the five-star cards. Another train wreck happening here. Crone has auto heals. Actually, Crone and Fu share the same awakenings, except they change the row color and they have the same template for their active skill basically but neither of them are actually contributing anything meaningful you get a bit of auto healing you get i, 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 I don't know i guess corona is prettier compared to foo and that's just her main selling point but like it's a terribly outdated card i feel like even upon her release she was a terrible card and that was many years ago so if you're a terrible card upon release you're probably even more terrible several years later after all of the power creep that has gone through pad just Disappoint. I didn't even bother. To I don't know. I, yeah, terrible. On the bright side, Beach Goemon is kind of like a shining star amidst the six, five, and four star cards because Beach Goemon has meaningful amounts of personal damage with three attack all below 50%, which is eight times personal damage. And he has a machine killer with two rows and an active skill that changes the whole board to fire orbs, deals a bit of button damage, as well as resetting your health to one to proc those damage awakenings. So on a team with mono fire swiping, Beach Goemon can definitely be utilized. He's a reasonably strong card. And the only main drawbacks are Machine Goemons actually exist. And Machine Goemons provide that same board changer, but a different secondary effect. And I feel like the best way to utilize the three different Goemons here are finding which active skill you need to bring for a given dungeon, because each of those secondary effects can have meaningful applications. The reset health to one definitely helps your personal damage for anyone with a tackle below 50%, but if you have lots of preemptives, not such a good idea. On the other hand, if you have locked orbs, you can counter them. The idea is like you have different options available, so I think it's a reasonable card. I wouldn't roll this event to pursue him, but if I... If Beach going on was my free roll, I won't be sad. I'll be like, well, that was expected, and I'm not unhappy about it. I'll take it. I'm not going to pursue more of him, but hey, it's a reasonably reasonable card, especially at a bottom rarity. Next is Beach Navi, and from her awakenings, it looks like she could be a powerful card, but the problem is these weighted stats are so low. Even with co-op boost, they're still quite low, but those enhanced hard orbs won't do much if you have low RCV. So it's kind of a weird thing. It's kind of like Mel in the sense that you have low RCV and some enhanced healers, but it's not enough enhanced healers to make up for the terribly low RCV. And again, just low stats overall. It's just going to be a card that's truly hard to take advantage of. Like years ago, Beach Navi was reasonable overall. Like she could be fit on several teams. Co-op was a bit more prominent as well. Like I could make her work. Nowadays, I just could not make her work. So do I plan to roll? and dream rolls. Well, the obvious answer is I do not plan to roll. There is so little value in the vast majority of cards, and the rolling pool is so heavily skewed towards acquiring the bottom rarity, which have lackluster value, but hey, let's dream anyways. For my nine star cards, I would love to have Planner. I feel like she surpasses Beach Varroa overall in terms of her utilization in her base forms, as well as a stronger weapon assist to transition later if she ever does get power crept. So it's just hedging my bets overall. I'd rather have Planner over Varroa for my personal usage. 
For 8-star, Yogg is kind of a default choice, quote-unquote, because I have rolled in Super Godfest in the past that featured beach cards, and I have a beach fusion, I have Barbara and Julie, and I think I have a beach Eshimali as well, so Yogg is the only one I don't have, so I'd be like, I'd love to get Yogg. I don't think I even have any kind of Yogg actually on my Mantastic account, so having a Yogg would be nice, but let's say I didn't have any of the 8-star cards. I feel like I would flip-flop between, I don't know, it's hard to say, like Yogg, Barbara and Julie and Beach Fusion all serve different purposes, and it depends on where you are at this point in time in the game, which would be what you would possibly want. But again, I wouldn't necessarily monster exchange for any of them. Like they are nice, but they're not nice enough to trade for. For seven star cards, I'll go with Beach Metatron because I think she's the prettiest, and perhaps I'll get more value out of her compared to others. She is a reasonably strong water healing solution. I feel like I prefer her over Lakshmi, mostly because of the shorter base cooldown and a cooldown that does a little bit more overall. Six stars is Erd because she's the least terrible. I don't think it's necessary anyways, but she's le the least horrible. Corone is just less ugly compared to Fu for five stars. And Goemon is actually pretty good. So like I said, if I get Beach Goemon as my free roll, I won't be that unhappy. I'll be like, cool, and I'll move on. So in conclusion, the Pad Island event is a top-heavy, disastrous place to spend your magic stones and rolling in because the vast majority of cards, the four, five, and six star cards comprise 75% of the rolling pool and almost all of them are garbage. And that's distressing. Like most of the rolls you are gonna have are garbage. That's not a good thing to think about. So if you are truly gung-ho on any of the, like the higher rarity cards, maybe utilizing the monster exchange system, but at the same time, a monster exchange in four beach planner or Varroa is quite costly. And you need to think carefully of whether or not Monster exchange for any of these cards will actually bring immediate value to your monster box. If it's not bringing immediate value to your monster box, and you, it's probably not worth the trade because you just sacrifice a bunch of valuable fodder. And if it's not going to advance your level of progress now, it wasn't a good trade. But either way, let me know what you think about the Pad Island event in the comments down below. Do you actually plan on rolling, monster exchanging? And if you do plan on doing either of those, let me know what your targets or goals are. Hopefully all the fantastic day. I wish you all the best luck in your own pad adventures and happy puzzling.